good evening. I'm Madeline Peel, and I'm the moderator of Community Board 8 Speaks. And tonight we're having a special session outside in Community Board 8, rather than in the television studio. And this is a, a public meeting on the, uh, the very important issue of the Second Avenue subway, which will run right through Community Board 8. In fact, we're going to have a 63rd Street station that will connect with the F line. We're going to have, and on Lexington Avenue, we're going to, because there's a turn there, then we have a 72nd Street stop, an 86th Street stop, and a 96th Street stop. Now this will make it, if it goes through, very much more convenient for a lot of people, but that convenience comes with a big price, and the price is that many, many people are going to have their lives disrupted, uh, and people traveling on uh, Second Avenue, um, whether in a car or, or uh, naturally public transportation, uh, on the bus, uh, any other way, are going to, even on foot, are going to have problems. And so we're interested in these kind of issues at the board because these are real issues for real people and lots of disruption can happen. So we're going to talk about issues like whether when you're dislocated or dispossessed of your apartment, what the workout deal will be from the MTA and how we at, at the board can help make resolutions to keep people in their housing, keep people intact, um, not to leave a community. That's very important. Um, why should you, if a, a subway is coming through, perhaps have to move? And the MTA is going to do, they have assured us, everything possible to make this as undisrupted to the community as possible. They'll be boring down oh, hundreds of feet below the ground so that they'll be able to work things out for people. And tonight what we're going to hear is about their problems um, in terms of how to relocate people and, and sensitivity to that kind of issue uh, from one of their real estate heads from the MTA, whose only job is that. And then we're also going to hear about from an engineer that works with the MTA um, how they're going to actually construct these type of, of uh, stations and alternatives. And then we'll have, of course, the public, since this is a public meeting, talking about what happens and what will happen to them. And of course, it's not the end of anything. So this is a chance for you to actually have a bird's eye view um, and an eavesdrop on the kind of things that really happen to real people. So we're very grateful that you're watching and you've tuned in. And come back for more public meetings with Community Board Aid Speaks. Thank you so much. Good evening. I'm here with uh, Dan Court, who is the chair of the Second Avenue Task Force for Community Board 8. And uh, this evening we're going to be discussing quite a few um, aspects of uh, the agenda. And hopefully we'll get to everybody. I, I know, Dan, that this is always difficult when, when we have a public meeting. We have about two hours' time. Um, could you tell me what some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight are? Well, you're right, Madeline. Yeah. The most difficult part of any public meeting is making sure people from different areas of the community are able to speak and being as fair as possible. Mm. Um, tonight the agenda is going to focus on the first half uh, of the meeting, the first hour, on tenants' rights, those oh. commercial and residential. Right. And and um, what are the kind of things that the board is most interested in from our task force standpoint? Keeping people here in community board eight so that they're not... I, I think the, the, the board's long <laughs> long-standing policy uh, of not wanting people to be to be displaced, uh, the dearth of housing for middle income and lower lower middle income people in this neighborhood, protected by rent stabilization, is a good thing. And this board wants to do everything it can to make sure that doesn't end. Yeah, and it is possible to transfer some of those rights uh, of rent stabilization to other buildings um, with special permission. And I'm sure if anyone can do it, the MTA can. Well, they certainly. They can and they should. With yep. the, the federal regulations at their back, they ought to make every effort to make sure that people not only have housing uh, quant quantifiable to what they have today, but that it lasts uh, for as long as they want to be on these side. Uh, right, and their quality of life includes their friendships and the people that they deal with in the neighborhood. And that's what the community board tries to do is, is keep people here and give them a voice. Well, thank you. We look forward to uh, this exciting session tonight. Um, it's always exciting when it comes to the Second Avenue subway because um, it's a transportation issue, it's a housing issue, it's, uh, it's got, oh, it's even transportation, for example, like local bus and other subway intersections in 63rd Street, the F train. I mean, those are important things, and I think um, we might even have an elected official. There's rumor that Pete Granis is going to come. I, I think Assemblymember Granis will yeah, be here, yeah. and he's been 
himself and Senator Kruger and Assemblymember Bing, as well as uh, Councilmember Miller and Moskowitz. And Moskowitz have all been very supportive of this issue. Yes, so they have. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank Madeline. You. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the semi-annual meeting of Community Board 8 Second Avenue Subway Task Force. Uh, tonight we have a packed agenda, so we're going to get right to it. And let me just outline what the agenda is going to be for the evening. Uh, the first item is going to be a presentation by the MTA as to condemnation potential displacement. After the MTA's presentation on those issues, we'll take questions and answers specific only to issues of condemnation or any issues specific to the presentation. My name is David Bosch. I am uh, in the MTA real estate department. I am the project manager for the real estate aspects of the 2nd Avenue subway. Um, We've put together a presentation that goes through the acquisition processes and relocation processes that we plan to follow for the 2nd Avenue subway project, both here in Community Board 8 and throughout the alignment. Um, just before we start, I'd like to say we are in the very early stages of the real estate acquisition process, um, even for phase one, which will begin uh, up in this in Community Board one, uh, 8. We do not expect to need to displace any commercial tenants until midway through 2006, and the first residential relocations would not be required for over two years, sometime in early 2007. However, what I'll do is go through the procedures and uh, answer as many questions as I can. Uh, the time allotted afterwards. So first, um, for the 2nd Avenue subway project, there will be a number, uh, there will be many acquisitions throughout the alignment from 125th in every, at every station all the way down to Hanover Square. The acquisitions will be of various kinds. Um, there will be full acquisitions, that's when we or otherwise known as fee acquisitions. That's when we acquire an entire building or an entire lot. Uh, most of these acquisitions will be for entrances or ancillary facilities, which include ventilation plants, cooling towers, and emergency egress from the subway platforms. We'll also be acquiring permanent easements. A uh, permanent easement is, uh, it's, a property right, it's a right to undertake a certain activity within a specific area. Permanent easements will acquire uh, typically in existing buildings for entrances. Um, the entrance, uh, the easement will be a volume of space in which we'll build our entrance and then operate the entrance. We will also acquire, uh, acquire permanent easements in some locations for the running tunnels for the trains. Most of the tunnels are under the public right-of-way, under 2nd Avenue, but in some cases they, they curve under private property, deep under private property, and in those cases we'll need permanent easements for the tunnels as well. The third kind of acquisition is uh, our temporary easements. These are typically used to support construction. Um, for example, if uh, an entrance was being put into a, an existing building, we would have a volume that we would use on a permanent basis for the entrance, but during the construction period, we would need to work outside that volume, five, 10 feet, maybe more, in order to actually build the entrance. Those are temporary rights that usually expire when the uh, work has been completed. Now, on to... Uh, onto the relocation aspect. Uh, as I mentioned, there will be tenants, both commercial tenants and residential tenants that will need to be relocated for this project um, in Community Board 8 and in every other Community Board as well. Um, the, the commercial relocations, uh, we have, uh, we typically seek to reach negotiation, negotiated agreements with all the tenants that we are displacing. We've been very successful at doing that over the years, and we'll look to do that um, for, for Second Avenue as well. Um, part of the 
part of the negotiation with commercial tenants is uh, compensating them for their trade fixtures. I'll talk more about that later. There will also be a uh, uh, relocation of residential tenants. Um, there are a number of buildings uh, in, in Community Board 8, which we plan to acquire. And when they are vacant, demolish them to make room for subway facilities. Now, the Uniform Act requires us to offer all tenants, uh, let's talk about residential first, all tenants a comparable replacement dwelling. Um, it's, uh, it's defined in the Act what that is. Um, we need to make a minimum of one available to each person. We will seek to make three or more available to each person. Let's go to the next slide and we'll, we'll walk through uh, what a comparable replacement dwelling is. Okay, this is, uh, it's, I'm basically paraphrasing the Uniform Act here. So uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll give you a website that you can go to to read the Act. Um, the comparable replacement dwelling that we uh, make available will need to be decent, safe, and sanitary, functionally equivalent, adequate in, si in size to accommodate the occupants. Uh, it does not mean it has to be the exact same size or as big as the apartment. It could be smaller, it could be larger, but it needs to be adequate in size to uh, accommodate the occupants. In an area not subject to unreasonable adverse environmental conditions, in a location not less desirable, um, this is not a, this is actually not a subjective uh, <laughs> wish of the tenant that's being relocated. It's, it's based more on the availability of public amenities, public spaces, um, and that a reasonable commute to work will be available for the displaced person. Um, on a site that is typical in size, um, for this area, it probably won't apply. To, it it's typically applies more to, to single family homes that are located, uh, that are that have uh, acreage associated with them, you would want to provide someone with acreage similar size. Um, that's not going to be happening up here in any case, I don't think. Um, currently available, which means that uh, if we offer it to someone as being available, they need to be able, they need to have the ability to enter into a, into a lease for the space. Within the financial means of the displaced person, um, this this basically means that uh, the rent that the displaced person would pay at the replacement dwelling, the new dwelling, cannot be more than the rent that they would pay at the old dwelling or the displacement dwelling. This, this last point is, um, it's not a permanent right uh, according to the Uniform Act. It is designed to ameliorate the effects of how to relocate, but it is not a permanent, permanent benefit. Let's go back to the previous slide. Um, okay. Comparable replacement space for commercial tenants. Uh, the, the slide that I just showed you that listed the eight, the eight uh, components to a comparable replacement drawing does not apply to commercial space. We do offer uh, at least one comparable space to commercial tenants that uh, wish to relocate. Um, we seek to seek to offer three or more over the last uh, gosh over the last decade. We have located successfully dozens of tenants um, on several different projects, um, virtually all of them through negotiated agreement. Um, we are uh, and will clearly be looking to do that again uh, for the second Avenue subway project. Let's go to number nine. Okay. Uh, okay, additionally under the Uniform Act, the relocation uh, parties to, that are going to be relocated, commercial or residential tenants, um, they are also required to be offered advisory services, plan assistance with planning their move, and assistance with coordinating their move. We will be hiring a relocation consultant that will help us with the project. Um, the consultant will, the, the, 
consultant in on a case-by-case -case basis, the MTA will actually go out to interview tenants, talk to them about uh, what they are looking for in terms of uh, replacement space. It will look at their existing space, look at their apartment, look at their store, um, so that we can get a good idea of what we are going to be trying to replace for them. Um, in addition to advisory services, uh, we will make payments for moving expenses and other related expenses like packing and storage if necessary. Um, we will pay the actual cost of that as long as it's reasonable. We will also make a schedule of fixed payments available that uh, at the tenant's option they'll be able to choose. Um, replacement housing payments. Uh, as we saw in the previous slide, the, the dwelling cannot be, to be comparable, the dwelling has to have the same rent as the dwelling that the person is being displaced from. The new dwelling has to have the same rent as the dwelling the person is being displaced from. Under the standard law that, that we can do without changing procedures or creating any new procedures, that entitlement is limited to $125 per month over three and a half years. Does the statute that you're referring to on relocation prohibit MTA from going beyond what this one year minimum of uh, cost for? No, it, the statute, per, uh, it, it allows us, if we determine that the standard, uh, the standard benefit, which I mentioned is $125 per month for three and a half years, is not adequate, it allows us to come up with an alternative program that could be more than that, yes. Well, let me, it could be more. let me follow up on the gentleman's good point is that I'm sure it's the consensus of this task force and this community board that we would strongly urge you to, to look at ways to ensure long-term stability of middle income tenants who have to be displaced. I mean, that's something that's very important for this community. So, let me ask you a question about 1772nd Avenue. Uh, I have uh, personally spoken with a lot of commercial tenants up and down that street. Their concern is not specifically 1770, but those in the surrounding area, 10 feet to the left to right. It's a lot of commercial stores, a lot of stores that have been in the East 90s longer than I've been there. Um, what can they expect in terms of the level of disruption, the continuation of disruption, and diminuate, I can't say the word, loss of business, and what they can expect in, in return for, uh, if they can prove a case in terms of a loss of business based on the construction of the project? Uh, if we acquire 1770, um, which I believe is a two-story building, we will pay the owner for the property, we'll demolish it and build our project. We won't, uh, we won't be offering compensation to next-door tenants just because we're building a new structure there. Question specific to this area. Yeah, you just raise your hand. Yes, sir. I'm uh, at 25087 Street. We have a garden outside. We have some lot. I know. Our property we've kept it. I'm not sure it's still what the structure is going to look like there. It says here it's 50 feet high. Is that from ground level or is that from below ground? I don't know what the structure is going to look like. Maybe one of these fellows. Well, I've been trying to get that for four months. But nobody, nobody can answer. Well, we got two issues. Uh, we need to get into your property to look at it, which we have been able to do. And uh, we've. Uh, you have been into our property. The attorney that we hired said that that's what you said, but you have been into our property. You have been downstairs months ago. If we need it, always been cooperative. But let me get to the combination okay. issue. Mm -hmm. Now we're on the corner there, and you say that you're going to make this blend into the urban fabric. I'm not sure which urban fabric we're talking about. But if we're putting this 50 foot structure, 70 feet long, that's going to block, in essence, our lobby, and I don't know how many floors higher, do we have any input in the design of the blending of the urban structure that's going to be put there? I think in all cases where we're uh, building facilities on a private property, we have been open. We, I believe we've met with your attorney already. We're open to continued meetings about regarding the design, the location. It has to work for us, and, it, and we'd like to make it. I understand. The reason we went to an attorney is because nobody was getting back to us. I just wanted, I'm the chairman of the board there, and for months and months and months I've been trying to figure out what structure you're talking about, where do you want to put it? We're in 
contact with your attorney now, and we're happy to meet with them, uh, you know, at our mutual convenience. Um, on October 8th, a letter was authored by Lois Handler um, of the MTA. That letter was received by the board office sometime this week. And in that letter, the letter essentially rejects the, res the prior resolution of the task force concerning the proposed train station entrance at 86th Street. And we specifically told the MTA that based on factors concerning quality of life and other factors. It was our opinion that the train station entrance should be moved to the open end plaza on 85th Street. Now they rejected that proposal in writing. Um, this board voted 38 to nothing overwhelmingly in support of that resolution. So now we're going to go to this. Now, now, having said that, we're going to move to the specific portion. Why can't I speak? No, no, sir. Not at this juncture. You, know, no you did. A moment ago, you were very concerned. And at this point, we're going to move to. A moment ago, you were very concerned about having people present when you discuss something. But you passed that resolution to move it to 85th Street without any of us being we there. No opposition because we weren't here. One more. Unfortunately, uh, there's no accuracy for so one step. Uh, oh. oh. It's absolutely accurate. That's and right. you're being disingenuous by saying it's well, not. Exactly. We're going now on to the 85th Street. Um, what we're showing here is the alternative that was uh, proposed to provide an entrance rather than at 86th Street, to place it at 85th Street in, in uh, front of the, uh, the apartment building located here to, as I said, to get down into the station, uh, which is at something like 70 feet depth. We need uh, a long line of escalators. The, the entrance will therefore have to be constructed partially in cut and cover in front of the building to get the, the escalator down through the, the overburden overlying the rock and then across the street to get into the rock and then uh, as, a, as an inclined shaft through the rock to get down to the, the level of the station. Now, we've just in the last few days completed a geotechnical boring at this location in order to find out just where the level of the rock is and how much cut and cover excavation we would have to do. And that has shown us that, of course, at this location, Rock is a little bit deeper than elsewhere on Second Avenue at this position, and therefore the amount of cover we would have to do in order to safely construct this this entrance would mean us having to take an additional residential property on the north side of 80, 85th Street, in addition to constructing the entrance on the south side of 85th Street. Uh, so. The, the problems we see with this are, one, there's a large amount of, uh, of cut and cover both in front of the apartment building and on, across 85th Street. We've got an additional residential property that we would have to take in order to construct it because of the depth to rock. Um, the position of the entrance would actually block the entrance into the apartment building. In order to provide viewing space and sufficient uh, Pedestrian, uh, pedestrian area on 2nd Avenue in front of the entrance, the location of the entrance would have to be such that it would block the, ent the entrance into the apartment building. Um, this would also uh, introduce, because of its position, uh, increase the length of the underground passageway required to get into the station. Now, we don't have any specific data to demonstrate it, but we, the perception amongst the ridership is that longer underground passageways are less safe yeah. and not preferred. Um, and, it, and, and the final point is that uh, this would require a number of additional underground evenings in order to be constructed. So for those reasons, we feel that this, this alternative, the 85th Street entrance, is, is, less, is less attractive and more expensive than what we were originally proposing at the Food Emporium at 86th Street. Spoil sheds. Uh, most of the debris is going to be moved out horizontally until it gets to a shaft, and then it goes vertically. 
why do we even have shares? Why isn't the whole thing just moved out uh, horizontally and then a shaft at the end of uh, like 6th Street and 4th Street? Why do you have shafts in between? We have to move, we cannot move all the spoils through 92nd Street. The way we have our schedule and the way we need to do the work. Uh, plus, when we start over the 72nd Street contract, the connection won't be done between, you know, a 72nd Street station and 96th Street station. And these stations are very big, three-track terminal stations. We're going to have a tunnel boring machine going from 92nd Street. So we're already taking spoils at 92nd Street. Okay, my second question then is, we have a uh, subway entrance in 305. The building across the, uh, the northwest corner is being taken down, as I understand it. So we not only have an entrance into our building, but we have a spoil shaft right out in front of that entrance. Why couldn't this well shaft be across the street where there won't be a building? Our concern is the fumes, the rodents will have direct access right into our building because your shaft is right in our entrance. We, oh, engineering wise, we looked at it uh, to have the entrance on the east side of it, uh, of the Second Avenue. It, uh, you know, the way we had to do the tunnel construction, and that we found that as the best location. Your concerns about the rodent and everything. We have a factor control program in our contract that will be required, contractor will be required to take care of that work program. My point being, you have the shaft right in front of the entrance. So clearly, your engineering could have designed it across the street. Because that also has an exit, an entrance into the same station. Right. The these shafts are the temporary construction, you know. While we are doing the construction, once that is done, we'll put it back. That's two and a half years. Oh, no, two and a half years for the share, five years for the share. So when you say it's ten years for the station, yeah, for the, how, long, how long will that shaft be open? For the duration of the construction. Five years. So that's like permanent. So wouldn't it be better to be across the street in front of a vacant lot than in front of our building? We'll get back to you on this.